Good evening. Um, welcome to For Meet the Poet. My name is Holly and this evening we're very pleased to welcome Natalie Diaz who will be in conversation with David Wheatley. Now I can see our audience numbers are just starting to arrive. So while we're waiting for everyone to get here and to get settled, I'm going to explain how the chat works. So if you haven't been to a Zoom webinar before, if you take your cursor and you hover over the image of me speaking now, you should see some options come up on a bar beneath me. Um, and that includes one of them is a chat option. If you click on that, the chat box should open up um, on your right hand side. Um, and you can put questions in there for Natalie, or you could just say hello and let us know where you're calling from. But remember, when you do write in the chat, if you um, click on the little blue button that allows you to say who you're sending it to. So you want to select all panelists and attendees because otherwise you could end up typing away and no one will be able to see it. Um, so yeah, we're getting a few more people coming in now. I'm gonna kick off the chat by um, putting a link to the Faber website, sadly, Faber isn't currently selling books directly from their site, but they've got their own list of recommended retailers to buy the fantastic post-colonial love poem. This is a proof, so it is not the gorgeous teal colour, which you'll see Natalie reading from very soon. Um, I think I can see those numbers levelling out, so it's time to kick off. Um, the event will take about 45 minutes, and I will introduce David. David was born in Dublin and has published five collections of poetry, most recently The President of Planet Earth, which was published by Carcanet. A former Ford Prize shortlistee, he has been awarded the Rooney Prize for Irish Literature and the Vincent Buckley Poetry Prize. He writes on poetry for many journals, including The Guardian, Times Literary Supplement and the London Review of Books, and is the author of a critical study, Contemporary British Poetry. He lectures at the University of Aberdeen. Welcome, David. Welcome. Thank you. Ooh, bye bye, David. I'm back now. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have you. Thank you. Well, to get things uh, kicked off, then, I'm going to introduce Natalie before we uh, proceed to our chat. Natalie Dieth was born and raised in the Fort Mojave Indian village in Needles, California. She is Mojave and an enrolled member of the Gila River Indian tribe. Natalie's poetry came to prominence with her first collection, When My Brother Was an Aztec, which I'll hold up with its extremely striking cover image, in 2012. A wrenching portrait of family history and where it collides with larger histories and conflicts. And with post-colonial love poem, her work has expanded, I think, into whole new mind maps of American territory and story. We move between Native American and Greek myth, the politics of water, poems about basketball, which Natalie has played professionally, take that, UK poets, and some simply electrifying love poems too. Natalie is the Maxine and Jonathan Marshall Chair in Modern and Contemporary Poetry at Arizona State University and in recent years has also worked with Mojave language speakers, a crucial act of cultural witnessing against erasure. A Guardian review recently suggested that Natalie's new book is the American import poets over here have most to learn from since Ginsburg's Howl. Back in 1965, Ginsburg packed out the Royal Albert Hall and pandemic permitting, I've no doubt Natalie could do likewise the next time she visits these shores. In the meantime though, here she is now and let's get our chat started. Well, Natalie, there's a lot of politics in your work, but I feel I'd be oversimplifying if I asked you merely to comment on current events in the US, since as you say at the very start of your book, the war never ended and somehow begins again. In other words, mm -hmm. the bad news started a long time before 2016. Would it be fair to say that the categories of the public poem and the private poem are a bit more complex for a poet of Native American heritage? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think like the idea of the public and private are still important relationships and um, for 
you know, whether you're a native or, um, you know, really anybody, we live in a time of kind of incredible, you know, surveillance. Um, I think one of the ways I'm trying to engage these relationships of what is public and what is private is the same way that I'm trying to engage them in my life now. Um, so it's not, I mean, I, I guess what I mean is I don't, you know, I think we're always worried about risking uh, the private or for some reason we, we, we've given the private so many names, whether that's confessional or, you know, all of these different categories, but uh, I mean, in a way, um, being being native, being queer, being Latina, uh, being being judged or seen through your traumas and your wounds, that's that's an immediate condition of the the private made public, the intimate, um, somehow becoming a part of a narrative that, in some ways, is is no longer yours. And so, um, for me, one of the one of my goals, at least now with language, with poetry, is trying to figure out how I can, I can create just a space between, you know, me and my thoughts, me and my wonders. From there, me and my partner, me and my family, me and my lovers, me and my friends, and to kind of build out. Um, but, you know, any, I think any condition of nation or empire is, is you know, systematically politic. Um, you mentioned the word surveillance there at the beginning of your answer, a very interesting frame for this question. My next question was going to be about mythology, but I suppose the two are connected in the sense that we are who we are, but maybe we also are um, who people see us to be. Uh, you write in one poem, I have never been true in America, America is my myth. So on this deeper level, myth becomes reality, reality itself is a myth. Um, can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that that you can look at it through that lens, right? It's a lens of control. Um, it's trying to hold everything within uh, a very narrow scope, and the scope is often controlled by, you know, by someone else. Um, I mean, it's interesting to think, uh, you know, setting my native stories next to uh, Greek myth or uh, Catholic iconography or, you know, Catholicism, and some of those... Uh, some of those rituals. I think myth, for me, one of the ways I look at myth is myth really is uh, a ritual of, of story. It's a ritual of, of language. Um, and so, you know, I think, yeah, myth is another mode of surveillance, is another mode of, um, of nation, another mode of erasure <clears throat> in some ways. You know, what is myth? Um, and then I, I think there's also another condition of myth, which is <clears throat> it's a mode of language in which we're just trying to make it through the day, or we're trying to somehow understand what does it mean to be human um, in the midst of all of these other energies and lives. Like, you know, what do I have to tell myself sometimes just to get up in the morning? But what do I have to tell myself to take care of my body? What do I have to tell myself um, to try to understand an almost impossibly, impossible to understand relationship with land or water, you know? And so it, it, I think myth has more to do with the impossibility of the human condition and the way we've set ourselves uh, on this kind of trajectory. Um, and so it's no surprise, I think, that myth is often, uh, you know, riddled with horrors and traumas. All right. Well, how better to uh, put the flesh and the bones of these questions than maybe to have a first poem at this point? Um, Would yeah, you like to yeah. suggest some uh, text to read? Um, so I'm I'm coming to you now from um, from my reservation, so Mojave land, so uh, Makab on Matinch, which is on the border of the Col Colorado um, River and California, Nevada, and Arizona, and so. Um, if you, do you want to suggest a poem or do you want me to read a poem or? Well, I know that you're going to be talking a bit about rivers and showing us uh, some video, I think, later, but would you like to read something about the Colorado River, perhaps? Yeah, uh, what if I, um, so what if I kind of give us a condition and I read the title poem? Okay. And then I think that will kind of uh, 
that will kind of like invite you into where I'm at right now. And then I think then the idea of the river suddenly, um, I'm hoping will will be kind of a, a generous space. Uh, Excellent, okay. Post-colonial love poem. I've been taught bloodstones can cure a snake bite, can stop the bleeding. Most people forgot this when the war ended. The war ended depending on which war you mean. Those we started before those millennia ago and onward those which started me, which I lost and won. These ever blooming wounds. I was built by wage. So I wage love and worse. Always another campaign to march across a desert night for the cannon flash of your pale skin, settling in a silver lagoon of smoke at your breast. I dismount my dark horse, bend to you there, deliver you the hard pool of all my thirst. I learned drink in a country of drought. We pleasure to hurt, leave marks the size of stones, each a cabochon polished by our mouths. I, your lapidary, your lapidary wheel turning green, mottled red, the jaspers of our desires. There are wild flowers in my desert which take up to 20 years to bloom. The seeds sleep like geodes beneath hot feldspar sand until a flash flood bolts the arroyo, lifting them in its copper current, opens them with memory. They remember what their God whispered into their ribs. Wake up and ache for your life. Where your hands have been are diamonds on my shoulders, down my back, thighs. I am your culebra. I am in the dirt for you. Your hips are quartz light and dangerous, two rose-horned rams ascending a soft desert wash before the November sky untethers a hundred-year flood. The desert returns suddenly to its ancient sea. Arise the wild heliotrope, scorpion weed, blue phacelia, which hold purple the way a throat can hold the shape of any great hand. Great hands is what she called mine. The rain will eventually come or not. Until then, we touch our bodies like wounds. The war never ended and somehow begins again. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. You write We're so much. We're Sorry. on the cusp of monsoon season right now too. Oh, okay. So in the desert, um, this is kind of the month where, you know, I mentioned that hundred year flood um, and we're near that time. It's been, I mean, you know, climate wise, it's been a while since we've had those floods, but um, we're, we're right now on the edge of our big storm season. So that's really uh, exciting. Okay. Well, you write so much and so well about the natural world. Um, some people don't like the term environment with its implications that humanity always remains at the center of our concerns but in poems like the one you've just read and the first water is the body and exhibits from the american water museum you chart a very straightforwardly non-western understanding of our connections to nature specifically to the colorado river can you say some something more about that yeah I I mean, some of this just has to do, I mean, this is why I think language is such an important, um, it's such an important uh, mode of carrying the body or it's such an important manifestation of our bodies is that, you know, language is so prophetic. So I was raised in a language that was a part of my body's practice that was a part of, um, that was related to the land, like the idea that our language develops and is shaped literally by the land. Um, that is shaped by the ways we move on the land. And then that, you know, the land also shapes our bodies, shapes our mouths. And so there's this kind of, I mean, I realize how lucky it is um, to have this perspective to, you know, I, I'm thinking back to um, to your, the, the book you wrote, uh, The Wandering Mountains. There's like, a, there's a moment in the book where um, you, you kind of have the, one. I that book was very interesting to me because you talk about a ring of mountains and mm. or a ring of hills, and I'm in a valley, which most people would look around and not 
recognized the ring of mountains because they're desert mountains. Okay. Um, so immediately I found a place that, that felt, uh, you know, like an opening to me revisiting my own home. But there's a moment in there um, where you're talking about, you call it a, you use the word plurality. Um, and I think it's a hopeless plurality and kind of setting that adjacent to or next to um, the possibility of be, being rooted there more, more securely. So you have the idea of plurality setting next to the idea of being rooted yet that's the condition that I was raised in. Sure, sure. That, that the idea of plurality or simul simultaneity, um, that that is the condition of, of quote, nature or what sure. is the environment is. And so I can at once be, be human. And, you know, of course, now we live in these capitalistic uh, urgencies and, and desires, but I can be, all of those things and still, you know, fighting to survive on the land um, and still imagine myself as a caretaker of it and still imagine myself as having a responsibility to it. Okay. Um, and th so that feels just very connected to all of the lenses that I, uh, that I arrive at language with. I don't know that one, we use the word body a lot, so I don't know that I consider one body any less energetic yeah. land language, my own. Well, uh, I, I hope the River Colorado, the River Dawn, can maybe exchange email addresses and have a collaboration. <laughs> but um, um, still on this issue of humanity in or versus nature, a few years ago, Alice Oswald uh, put together an anthology of poetry about nature, but she very pointedly excluded the great romantic poets, Wordsworth and Coleridge, I think because she didn't actually explain why, from the sense that in the European romantic tradition, the great artistic sensibility, it looks down from the mountaintop on nature, it stands above and apart from it. As against which, here's a line of yours, it is a part of my body, I carry a river, it is who I am, aha makav, this is not metaphor. Now, th those are very uh, impressive ringing words. Um, they take a lot to back them up though as well, don't they? That, that must be a, a huge imaginative effort, which burden to carry. Yeah, and this is why I, I really like the word imagination. I know it's become a currency, you know, innovation, imagination. They, you know, they've, they've been beaten down. Um, however, like, I think that is what, that is what a life is. Like, the imagination is a kind of energy. You know, it's a, it's an impossibility. Um, and so, I mean, and this is why for me, poetry has been very important. And it's also why I struggle a little bit on the side of, of what is the poetry business is that I, I really try and I, and I fail quite often, you know, and, or maybe I fail always, but in trying to uh, ask myself, like, what does it mean that I have this language? What does it mean that I have this time to, uh, to imagine myself existing in language in these, you know, many like sensual and faceted ways, and 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 what what can I do with that? You know, like the question I ask my students often is like, what is the language we need to exist right now? What is the language I need to live right now? And I mean, it is it's it's very difficult to um, to create, you know, those conditions within all of the different layers of institutionality and nation that we're in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, I think it's not difficult if, if you can find a way to step outside of, of uh, all of the expectations that, that you've been told, you know, like this, okay. is, this is what poetry is supposed to mean. And I've found it to mean just the opposite in most instances. I'm going to suggest it's time for a second poem at this point. Oh no, the sound. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh. I can. <laughs> <laughs> you went away briefly. Just, just in case you missed me there, I've got to suggest we have another poem. We're, we're going to develop like an entire new way of speaking to one another because of these Zoom, you know, it's like once we get back out into person, we're going to have all of these like new iterations of time and space and what comes between. So I'm going to, I'm going to read a, just some excerpts. So I'm going to read okay. an excerpt from the first water is the body, and I'm going to read an ex 
excerpt from um, uh, the Water Museum poem. And uh, I'm gonna show a little bit of a video just so uh, I would like you all to know what my river looks like um, and what, I, what I'm talking about a lot. So I'm gonna screen share. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll read a couple and then I'll come back to you, David. Thank you. <clears throat> So this is from um, the exhibit from the American Water Museum. 2,345. The river is my sister. I am its daughter. It is my hands when I drink from it, my own eye when I am weeping, and my desire when I ache like a yucca bell in the night. The river says, Open your mouth to me and I will make you more. Because even a river can be lonely. Even a river will die of thirst. I am both, the river and its vessel. It maps me alluvium, a net of moon-colored fish. I flash through it like copper wire, a cottonwood root swelling with drink, I tremble every leaf to lime, every bean to gold, jingle the willow in the same song the river sings. I am it and its mud. I am the body kneeling at the river's edge, letting it drink from me. And then this is from the first water uh, is the body. Hamakav is the true name of our people given to us by our creator who loosed the river from the earth and built it into our living bodies. Translated into English, hamakav means the river runs through the middle of our body the same way it runs through the middle of our land. This is a poor translation, like all translations. In American imaginations, the logic of this image will lend itself to surrealism or magical realism. Americans prefer a magical red Indian or a shaman or a fake Indian in a red dress over a real native. Even a real native carrying the dangerous and heavy blues of a river in her body. What threatens white people is often dismissed as myth. I have never been true in America. America is my myth. And those are just some images from, uh, from a river. We just went down there the other day because I was like, what can I maybe show them of where I'm coming from? Okay. Well, two themes that run together very closely, I find, where rivers are concerned are eros and wounding. I mean, you mentioned there, uh, you explained elsewhere, a line you've just read is a semi-quotation from Mahmoud Darwish, is it not? That even a river can die of thirst which is yeah. a very, very haunting image. But in previous, uh, the previous poem I think you read, very strong connection between eros and thirst, thirst and longing. Do those two things naturally run together in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like one of the ways I've been thinking lately is that we, we're created in a state of desire. And that's what, that's what life is. It's a kind of you know, it's, it's the idea that the ecstatic is not as far away as uh, Western religions have taught us that it is. Like the, the, the ecstatic, the idea of pleasure, the idea of desire, those things I believe are natural conditions of, of what the human life is. And in some ways, I believe they're, they're manifestations of something far beyond the human, far beyond my human life. It, I believe it's, it's connected to you know, to all of these lives from the smallest to, you know, to the largest, to from the quietest to the most turbulent. And so, yeah, so I think that's a lot of the reason why I've, I've woven, uh, intentionally woven, you know, desire, sexuality, um, the, the idea of the ecstatic and pleasure into uh, what we would normally categorize and set outside and be like, this is what environmentalism is, when, when really environmentalism is is very rooted in the human idea of controlling it or having to work against it to survive. Sure. Now, well, while I'm asking you these questions, I hope that people tuning in will be thinking of their own, which uh, 
just to echo what Holly said earlier, we are inviting you to drop that into the chat box along the side and I can uh, read them out. But well, um, I had another one of what you just read out. This is a poor translation, like all translations. Your work very much moves between languages and poetry in Spanish, I wondered, is that an influence on you? I'm thinking of the great Peruvian poet, uh, Cesar Vallejo, who, uh, yeah. as you may know, had uh, Quechua, indigenous heritage. Uh, does his work or the work of other, other Spanish language poets lurk behind yours? Yeah, I mean, Ode to the Beloved Hips uh, is a poem that um, leaped directly from Vallejo. I was reading, um, I was reading a Rebecca Saferly's translation of the Black Herald. Um, and it was the poet, the speaker was, was remembering um, his lover. And, uh, and I was thinking of that poem and I was also thinking of, um, of Salinas's poem, um, uh, La Voz a Ti de Vida, and that moment when Salinas says, uh, I think of you beyond, beyond, like beyond me, you're in my blood, like, so there's this beyond, 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 and, and to me, that's like getting, getting to the point of, of ourselves that our human minds can't understand, and so I think definitely those Spanish language poets, um, including, you know, Lorca, including um, Borges, but, but largely Central and South American poets have definitely influenced um, the ways I think about love. I mean, the Spanish language has an incredible capacity for tenderness. Um, you know, it's of course a colonial language when it arrives here, but there's something about the way that it couldn't quite conquer indigenous languages in Central and South America that uh, its, its physicality and the way it's able to touch a body tenderly, even though it, of course, has touched it violently. I think it's, uh, like a, it's a capacity that um, I don't think English has, so. Well, we have a, a question and I can put to you straight away, which connects with those um, subjects. Question to Natalie, do you swim in the river? If so, how does the immersion of the body in a different medium expand your writing? That's from Angela. Yeah, uh, that's good, Angela. Um, yeah, I swim. I mean, it's kind of, it's one of the only ways you can survive out here. Like the temperature, it was like 122 the other day, 110. Um, and pretty normally in the, you know, one teens. I don't know what that is where you all are. I'm, I'm terrible at math, so um, I can't convert that. But yeah, I mean, and, and also the river is, it's our way of, uh, like cleansing ourselves, it's our way of um, kind of reorganizing. There's a line in our, uh, in one of my poems, it's like, um, we are rearranged. And, and that's something that feels very important to me, like to go to my river, to be in that water, it, it rearranges me, it reorganizes me and uh, it reminds me of myself in a lot of different ways. And then there's just the utilitarian, very utilitarian um, fact that in this hot, in this heat, the river is one of your only ways to, to make it through. Sure. Sorry, uh, well, another question is coming in, which maybe we can connect to a further poem from you. And the question is, can I ask, this is from, sorry, <laughs> the shadow is a bit poor. Is it Tariel? Um, can I ask what your inspiration was for I Minotaur? Uh, well, maybe, do you want to think about that while perhaps you read that one next? Yeah, it's a few, I mean, it's a few minutes long. So, I mean, it's not like 12 minutes or eight minutes long, but um, I'll go ahead and read that. And then, um, David, you have this kind of incredible light on you. It's like this, almost like how my river looks, you know, in the, in the shallows. Um, the halo. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the halo, maybe. <laughs> you might be pushing it a bit there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll read, I'll read it. And I'm gonna do another screen share. Okay. What, just one of the quick things I want to talk about uh, as I'm reading it is uh, I was really trying to imagine could I put myself, uh, could I put uh, all of the different eyes that I am, could I put uh, the, my relationship with the, the brother um, and then the, the Minotaur, uh, could I hold them all in one voice? Um, and then what you'll see is that I, I imagined just continually turning and, and so 
the poem to me feels like it has a lot of corners and it opens up and then immediately turns. And so there's a way that it, it just, it, it's a, yeah. So, so you'll hear that a little bit. And then I'm going to, um, I'm going to just share this. It's a slideshow. So you'll see, it's a series of images that became the cover for my American edition of the book. Um, but it's again, the idea of trying to be uh, unpinnable to try not to be held in one, one place. So I'll play this and then I'll read uh, I Minotaur while it's playing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do a quick okay. screen share here. Yeah, sorry, I'm native, so I, I talk a lot. Um, I'm not, I, <laughs> all right, here we go. Um, you can see that, yeah, David? I can see it, yeah. All right, great. And gracias for that question. I, Minotaur, I am an invention, dark alarm, Briaris's hand striking the bells of my blood. Whose toll am I? I think too much. Each morning, the Minotaur Maki. Through the night I swing the sickle of my wonders, a harvest work of touch and worry. Spend dawn and its day burning my dead. Who fell in the night? What the night reaped? I am every answer, a mathematics of anxiety. How any mall can solve the mesquite tree for the pyre. In my chest, I am too hearted always. Love and what love becomes arrive when they want to and hungry. The locusts disappeared the fields then themselves. I bent, wept alone on the threshing floor, not for what went stick to the feast. I wept for the locusts. I know what it's like to be appetite of your own appetite citizen of what savages you, to dare bloom pleasure from your wounds and to bleed out from that bouquet. A head like mine was shaped on thirst. I dream what is wet or might quench aquifers, rivers, cenotes, canals, the dusk mirage of lake above your knee. I sit and lick my tongue blush as the florest ear of a jackrabbit. I obey what I don't understand, then I become it, which needs no understanding. The astonishment of my body's limits, how it is easily divided by a black field and the black field multiplied in stars, the throng of a lover constellating. Like any desert, I learn myself by what's desired of me, and I am demoned by those desires. For this I move like a wound, always and fruiting, sweetened by the thorn. The tumbleweed turns and turns until it bursts free all its spores into the wind, until it is only what it might become. There is no such thing as time or June, only what you're born into, only waiting for the rain, for the flood, for what erupts my badlands and my tired eyes in beauty. Mojave Aster, desert globe mallow, where once was terrible nothing. There is no God here in these flesh hours, though your jaw is a temple and your hips strike like an axe, the labyrinth I injure myself against. But you, called to hear by me, come softly into the bull noon of my body, and not unknowingly, You've heard me churn and lather, yet knock and enter. Together we are the color of magnets and also their doing. Manganese, lodestone, ores, the light will not touch, so we touch the light. Give it to one another until we are riddled and leaking with it. What else can we prostrate or set before the large feet of our creators, if not the diminishment of the body, this book of scars? Sand grinds like gears between my teeth, sparkling small machinery of want. What question can I ask of the thing I am? All I have done and failed to do. The furrows I tear with my grief mouth, a map of myself carved by my own horns. I have a name, yet no one who will say it not roughly. I am your native, 
and this is my American labyrinth. Here I am at your thighs, lilac lit pools of ablution. Take my body and make of it a nation, a confession. Through you, even I can be clean. Thank you very much. We have uh, some more questions I've been scribbling down while you've been reading. Um, well, ju just one that occurred to me, which I'll throw in the mix too. I was wondering, a kind of eternal question, whether it's the, the task of a, a poem like that to find the exit from the labyrinth, or maybe simply to imagine what it's like to be that prisoner inside the labyrinth. But just to um, read through the other questions, Rivak was asking whether the structure of language limits your connection to nature, maybe in more in the previous poems. Um, Jessica was wondering about the um, sense of limitation by Western narratives of separation between the human and the natural. And on a completely different subject, which is nevertheless worth turning our attention to as well, uh, Patricia very much enjoys your Twitter account for um, your conspicuous love of cocktails and wonders whether you've thought about doing doing a book on the subject like the Futurist Cookbook. Now, I'm not much of a cocktail drinker, but I would certainly, I'd buy that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm always a little torn between like, a, you know, I don't want to um, uphold any stereotypes about natives and alcohol, but um, you know, what's crazy is the one thing I've done and, and possibly to, to the detriment of other things is every day um, I make a drink. Uh, not always alcoholic often, but it's it's the one thing I do for sure in the day. And so there's like a, a kind of a clockwork about that. Um, and I, I basically frame my days around that. Um, and it's just something that's that's really fun. I I have kind of like the, the way that I think and work is is very like texturally sensual. So I think a lot about the way things smell and the way things feel. And I I think in image and color. And so for me, making a cocktail is similar to making a poem in that it feels very like sensual and it's happening in a lot of other places, not just in my hands. Um, but yeah, and then in relationship to uh, the separation of nature and subject of, um, of thinking about the Western lens, I, I mean, I think there's also something very exciting about the English language. Um, you know, I, I, I give it hell, of course, it's a language of conquest and, and, and in some ways, perhaps given enough time, many languages become languages of conquest. Um, but I, I, I think because of, of the, my relationship with the English language and that, you know, it is my first language and also, you know, my grandparents spoke Spanish. So that was, you know, in my, uh, in my ears and mouth and uh, the Mojave language because I was, you know, raised primarily with my my great aunt and my my great grandmother and and so I mean there's a way that the English language to me feels quite possible in in how we might break it and reorganize it you know I feel like it has a capacity it doesn't know yet and I think you know and, and maybe maybe like any person stuck in a labyrinth right the labyrinth of nation the labyrinth of, of uh, you know our own minds we have to be that um, we have to be that quote hopeful to say like yes I can carve out this space within this confining structure, but I do I, I think a lot about what it means that I write in English. Um, I think about what it means in terms of who I've been or who I'm made of, and uh, that I have this uh, this way of carrying my body that they did not. And in some ways, I think that is a that is uh, to the detriment of my own possibilities. And I also am very interested in wondering, um, you know, what, what there is of me that might be more because of the English language. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting paradox. But again, I think, I think that's what imagination is. That's what creativity is. It's neither this nor that. And I, I think both are these unknowns. Um, but yeah, I appreciate like thinking, uh, in terms of those planes. So gracias for the questions. Well, there will always be the shadow perhaps of the other language where Irish poetry is concerned, for instance, there is the, the shadow, the debt of obligation to the Irish language, which uh, writers even who don't speak that language would continue to feel 
But I remember Maeve McGuckian saying that she simply, she wrote Irish language poetry in English through one language through another. Um, could you say a bit more about your relationship to the Mojave language, which I know you work with and work to preserve? Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm always hesitant to make Mojave speak English. I'm more interested in imagining unraveling the English language um, in a way, again, um, that it can be reconfigured to possibly imagine the Mojave language. It's, they're really two different sensualities. It's unbelievable, uh, you know, and of course it's very simple also, like to imagine a language that, uh, a language that imagined a people, right? Versus a language that has uh, erased a people, you know, so we could, we could give them to visual, like imagining a people versus erasing a people. And so, um, yeah, and I tend to kind of keep them separate. Like I, I do use Mojave ways of, uh, like Mojave conditions or Mojave ways of, of existing or imagining. However, I don't move from one to the next, you know? So, I mean, uh, sometimes like right now we've been doing a lot of like pop songs and translating them into Mojave. But that's, you know, that's kind of as much as I, I will okay. force on it. <laughs> are, are there uh, young learners then who are doing this? Yeah, there are. I used to work for my tribe and now I work separately just with my teacher, Hubert. Um, but yeah, they're working on a kind of like a Montessori school. Um, it's, it's a difficult condition. Uh, and I mean, I, I think about uh, the language work in Ireland, um, in Sweden, and, uh, you know, just all of the different conditions. Hawaii has a very different um, condition. And so what it means to learn a language often has a lot to do with, or to relearn or revitalize, has, I, I believe, a lot to do with the land you're on. And if you're still on your land and you can still find connections, I feel like that's a, that is a part of, of relearning a language. Well, I think we're coming up to time, but I just have maybe one or two very quick questions. Um, how different do you think the conflicts of 1492 and ever since would have played out if they'd been decided, as you suggest in one poem, uh, by basketball games. Yeah, um, well, I, we certainly would have won. Um, but it's not uncommon for me to to walk into a room of poetry and like size people up. You know, like it, it's just something that's in the way I was made to kind of like, you know, yeah, to be like I could take that person or. Yeah, or, you know, it's also, it's also interesting to recognize athletes. Like I can come into a room and it's almost as if two athletes in a room kind of recognize each other. You can tell by the way, like people stand or hold themselves. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's not impossible yet, right? I mean, we may come down to, to okay. some sort of a <laughs> match. Would, would, that, would that be a good segue for maybe ending on a poem, whether, whether on the basketball theme or other? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I'll, I will end on, uh, I'll end on uh, desire, yeah, from the desire field. Uh, it feels a little bit like a kind of a positive poem. I know we're in, we're in the age of anxiety, right? Um, but for sure this time. So this for me is one way that I think of language, um, like the power of language. From the desire field. I don't call it sleep anymore. I'll risk losing something new instead, like you lost your rosen moon, shook it loose. But sometimes when I get my horns in a thing, a wonder, a grief, or a line of her, it is a sticky and ruined fruit to unfasten from, despite my trembling. Let me call my anxiety desire then, let me call it a garden. Maybe this is what Lorca meant when he said, verde que te quiero verde. Because when the shade of night comes, I am a field of it, of any worry ready to flower in my chest. My mind in the dark is una bestia, unfocused, hot. And if not yoked to exhaustion beneath the hip and plow of my lover, then I am another night wandering the desire field bewildered in its low green glow, belling the meadow between midnight and morning. Insomnia is like spring that way, 
surprising, and many petal the kick and leap of gold grasshoppers at my brow. I am struck in the witched hours of want. I want her green life, her inside me in a green hour I can't stop. Green vein in her throat, green wing in my mouth, green thorn in my eye. I want her like a river goes, bending, green, moving, green, moving. Fast as that, this is how it happens. Soy una sonambula. And even though you said today you felt better, and it is so late in this poem, is it okay to be clear to say, I don't feel good? To ask you to tell me a story about the sweet grass you planted, to tell it again or again until I can smell its sweet smoke, leave this thrashed field and be smooth. Gracias. Uh, thank you so much. Well, there's so much desert in your work, but in a poem like that, you make the desert bloom very effortlessly. I uh, can't think of a better note on which to end. Uh, I think maybe at this point we can hand back to Holly if she has any further announcements for us after that, that wonderful reading. Thank you so much for your, your answers. I was just going to thank both David and Natalie. Thank you for sharing your poems and thank you for sharing your river. And thank you to everyone who asked the question as well. Um, do go out and buy the book, which again doesn't look like this. This is a proof, but here David is showing you what it looks like in its beautiful, glossy, finished bookish flesh. Um, I'll pop a link to that in the chat. Um, we will be back next week to hear from Vicky Fever and her book, I Want, I Want. So it'd be fantastic um, to see you all again. But until then, uh, goodbye and thank you, David and Natalie. Yeah, gracias. Thank you. Bye-bye.